So my name is Victoria McPhail. I'm the coordinator of the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution, Conservation here at York University. And I welcome you to our Bee Biogeography and Systematics Talks. Um, so we're going to my internet connection is unstable, but hopefully we won't have trouble uh, sharing my screen to start. So logistics, many of you have been attending our seminars before or have been other Zoom webinars. Uh, as this is a webinar, only the panelists can share their their screens and have their cameras and uh, microphones turned on. Uh, so please use a chat box to share where you're from and the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions. Uh, please use that chat box sparingly right now for sharing where you're from, but then afterwards more or less leave it clear to avoid distracting uh, fellow participants. At the very end of the presentation, we'll pose those questions from the Q&A box back to our speaker. If you have any questions, please reach out to me uh, through the chat box or email bc at yorku.ca. Uh, we do have permission now to record this talk, and so it'll be posted probably later today or tomorrow on our YouTube channel, as well as many other talks. And you see here, just basically just search at Bees York, and you'll find all our YouTube channel presentations. I want to just take a moment to recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been taken by the Anishinaabek Nation, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and this territory is subject to the Dish of One Spoon Wampan Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and fair care for the Great Lakes region. I encourage you to check out this website, www.native-land.ca, to learn more about the Indigenous people of the area currently, um, in the past, of where you're currently living, or perhaps doing your research. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lawrence Packer uh, to introduce our guest speaker today. Hello, everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Antonio Aguiar, who is a professor in the Department of uh, Zoologia in the Universidad de Brasilia. I uh, will make uh, ho probably hopeless attempts at pronouncing things uh, the way a Brazilian would when it's a Brazilian word, but I apologize in advance uh, if this offends people's sense of taste and decency. So Antonio is uh, very passionate about nature and his studies on bees are mostly focused on questions related to biogeography and biodiversity of the Sahado. Um, he also likes plants and uh, he studies the interactions of plants with bees. Uh, Brasilia, where he is based, is in the middle of the Sahara, and the biodiversity and biogeography of this habitat is one of the main research areas in his lab, where they're studying oil collecting bees, stingless bees, carpenter bees, orchid bees, and solitary bees, which are very diverse and abundant in the Sahara. Um, so they're trying, working very hard to understand this diversity. So Antonio is currently on uh, leave from his university, working out of the University of Michigan, where he joins us today. And he will be visiting us in Toronto for some period of time, starting on later on this year. So with no further ado, I'll pass this over to Antonio to talk about, oops, I've, I've lost the time. <laughs> I've lost the title. Um, anyway, he, the title of, of his talk will be on the first slide, I imagine. Thanks a lot, Lawrence. Thanks very much. Your, your presentation about me was incredible. And if I can write about me, you'll be exactly like you, like you told me. Thank you also, Victoria, for the invitation. It's really nice to have this opportunity to to share my ideas about the Cerrado and also about the bees of Cerrado. It's why it's the main subject of this talk, to talk about the bees the, from the place where I live, where I do most of my research. And it's really incredible to have this chance to study these bees and also this ecosystem, which is really difficult. And then it's why I will give you some 
slides very illustrative about the Cerrado. This, the, the main title of my talk, it's like discovering the history of Cerrado through the Tapnotaspida and Bees. What is, what is the, the idea? That when I search for the, these bees, which I am a specialist, which I worked so hard time with the taxonomy of this group, I can find other, other endemic groups, other plants endemic of Cerrado. And also it's like a line that I have to, to research, to search for the, the, the Tapnotaspidine bees and also discover the partners of this diversification on, on Cerrado. I'm sorry for my bad English, but I hope we have an international audience that can understand my poor English, but it's okay, let's go ahead. Then, as Lawrence told, I am from Brasilia, in the middle of Cerrado. You can see this pale green is the Cerrado. You can see also a, a road here connecting Serra do Salito and Brasilia. This is the, the city where my father uh, comes from. And I used to stay in this area so long time with my family taking uh, swimming in the, the, in the river, having good time in the middle of Cerrado. It's why I have a, this passion to walk in Cerrado, to eat the fruits of Cerrado and also discover the bees of Cerrado. Most of the bees that I work, I collect with bees. I try to, 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 to look where these bees are. Then, my main questions about Cerrado is what Cerrado? It's a hard discussion because we can see numerous maps about Cerrado. How large is Cerrado? Cerrado is different from the another savannas of the natural region. Um, all of the savannas are the same. Uh, we have special bees of Cerrado, some endemic species, or we have a large package of bees that flies through Cerrado. Some of these bees nest on Cerrado, another one do not nest in Cerrado. We have forest in the middle of Cerrado. Where these bees come from? These bees come from Amazon, these bees come from Atlantic Forest, these bees come from Caatinga, these bees come from Cherokee areas. And how is the, these bees from Cerrado? We can see that most of the bees of Cerrado are oil collecting bees. And then I will talk about very fast about my ideas of studies on Cerrado bees and my projects. Well, let's go ahead. This is a very nice picture that I, that is the view of the house of my grandfather, now the, my sister house. And then from the house of her, we can see this very uh, natural area of Cerrado. You can see that uh, it's not like an open area. You have small packages of forest areas uh, connecting in the lowlands, connecting with bigger pets, smaller pets of forest. This is how the Cerrado works. This is the, one of the main images of Cerrado. And what it is, it's a savanna. You can see that's not just savanna. It's a grassland, it's the same of savanna. It's a grassland and savanna is the same. It's sherik. We can see that Cerrado burns many times. And also as a sherik area like Caatinga and Chaco, it, it's a very dry area. Yes, it's very dry. If you go to Cerrado in September, you will be scared in how hot and how dry it is. This is the picture of like February, October, which is November, I think so. That is most of the Sahad is totally green, but sometimes it's totally, totally brown. When we say about the uh, worldwide word to talk about Cerrado, so not, Cerrado is not something so special. Cerrado is just another savanna. What is savanna? 
savanna distinct from the other shark areas like in South America. Savanna is that place that is that's more mean uh, seen like a grassland that you have grass covering the the ground. If you don't have grass covering the ground, is the idea that you it's not a savanna. It will be like other kinds of areas. Then we have a large savannas in Africa. It's why we have big mammals that are grassers that eat the grass through the Africa. And also we have a large savanna in, in South America that we used to say the name Cerrado, which is not something different from the savannas. When we we think about the history of the savanna, we can go back to the past. And we will see, we have numerous works, studies that show that these savannas do not have the same history. They have like a unique origin of the grasses, but they are diversification, the species, the genus of these groups from Africa, from Australia, from South America is completely different. It's completely different. When you think about the savannas from South America, when you think about savannas from Africa, when you think about savannas from Australia, you are going to think about distinct groups of species, very distinct, but which have a high and fast diversification almost in the same time. When appear the C4 C4 uh, grasses, which was able to uh, to despair through the open areas and also burn very fast. It worked most of them in the Miocene, about 30 million years ago. It's the most have fast diversification and opening of the savannas from all around the world that you can see that these grasses, the C4 grasses, uh, appear and have a hub and very fast diversification through the Miocene. And then when you see the landscape, these pictures, you cannot say if the, the letter B, C, or A in, the, in this background of the, the image here is from Brazil or from Africa or from Australia, since the same is why they use the name savanna or grassland that have the, this, this ground covered by grasses. But the, the history of this, this, this savanna is completely different. What, what we can say about the South America grasslands, about the savannas of South America, we will have at least in this image from Google Earth, you can see clear that we have, have two large packets of forest, what we, what we used to say about it's the Amazon related to Amazon River Basin, and you have the coastal forests of the Atlantic Forest. In the middle, crossing like a diagonal of open areas, you have most of this area covered by grasses, what we, the people used to say the name of Cerrado. It's like a domain of the Portuguese people that use the name Cerrado, which is sometimes completely Things completely different from the savannas of the Pampas from Argentina and also from the Llanos from Venezuela, but they are really completely distinct. I think, no, we can, this is why we are here discussing about the savannas of the tropical region. When we see the Cerrado, the Cerrado, we have this high contact with Amazon, and with Atlantic forest, and we will have large pets of forests crossing from one side to another, promoting diversity. It's why we used to see the Cerrado Savannah as high diversified. If you make like a line to turn around what the people used to say the name Cerrado, which is in the middle of Brazil, we will turn about uh, 13,000 
species of plants. So you see about more than 100 species of mammals, more than 700 species of birds, in, a, our, in about the bees. If you start to count the bees, you will start to count all the bees from savannas, you will start to count all the bees from the Amazon areas, and also you start to count many bees that fly through Amazon, Atlantic Forest, Caatinga, Chaco, and other kinds of ecosystem that are close to, to Cerrado. We have a count of bees from Cerrado, from Isabel Alves dos Santos, that has a chapter in a book that is not very easy to access, that has more than 400 species of, uh, of bees on Cerrado. In my studies, we can see about 150 species in one hectare of like one acre of, of grassland in close to Brasilia. It's the common to find about 150 species in just a small patch of grasslands. It's why we used to say that Cerrado, when compared to Africa, is a high biodiversity, what they used to say that it's named hotspot with a large package of species. What explains this high diversity of species on Cerrado? It's not only the contact with the another ecosystems like Amazon, Atlantic Forest, Caatinga, Chaco, and other places, but also when you see the topographic maps, here you have the scale from zero, the sea level, to the 1,900. Uh, meters above the sea level, you, you will see that you will have many, many different uh, levels of high areas and lower areas. And you can imagine it for the species, you have different barriers to cross and also for the diversification of these bees along these areas. Here in the middle, we have Brasilia, where I live most of my time, then you have like a very complex area that has connection with this plateau and also small plateaus like here and also connections with another plateaus to the east and to the west and other isolated plateaus like in the Serra de Espinhaço, more north uh, western and in small plateaus almost close to the Amazon forest. All of this area, we have savannas over these plateaus. And also we have savannas in the, in the lower areas, but it's not so savannic. Sometimes we have more forest in the, the lower areas than we have the savannas in upper areas. It, as you, you can see, these like the, the plateaus that we have in Brazil, most of these plateaus currently are completely destroyed by the soil bee production. You can see this plateau by which completely destroyed. You can almost no, cannot see uh, natural areas in this plateau. You will only be, be able to access the borders of plateau to get the bees. And also you have the, this depression is about 400 meters, the difference, but it's a high difference when you see about the groups of bees that that is in the lower and the upper areas, and you will be, we see like uh, dry forests in these lower areas. You have forests close to the rivers in these lower areas, and in the upper areas of plateaus, you will have like a savannic landscapes dominated by grasses and a smaller trees. This is the kind of image that you have in the in the the Cerrado, what they used to say about savanna. These are in the Cerrado of Bahia. You have like a very sand soil, very poor soil, but nice for the agriculture because they can put a high amount of uh, pesticides and nutrients and transform the soil. But you have numerous species of different species of trees, bushes, small plants, grasses. 
This is our colleague who, uh, who is putting blue, blue uh, traps to collect bees, Alexandre, who is, was in the field this day. And also the Cerrado Savanna, this kind of area, will cover more than 70% of the all the landscape that currently we know as Cerrado. And also you have this dichotomic vision from the green to the brown that we can imagine that we have like two areas in the same area. Some plants are adapted to the dry season that can flower in the dry season and, and also are adapted to fire. And also some plants and bees that are, will only fly in the green, green season. This is the rainy season, it is the dry season. The dry season is not a small uh, dry season. It's like we have about four months without any rain, any rain. It's really dry and, the, and we have really high risks of fire and that when you start the fire is difficult to control and also we used to burn everything. But the bees never stops, it's always warm. The, the temperature do not go so 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 lower and then the bees is still flying but different species change the, the the season to season different species flies about one month change another group of bees and you can have high diversity of bees and plants in these areas when change the seasons and also when you go upper in the areas from the, from the 400 to, to 900, and then you go upper to 900 to 1,700 meters, we will start to see rock fields, that is area that is dominated by crystalline plateaus, which you have more, uh, more hard environment, and you will have more specialized plants, more specialized groups of bees, that we used to say it's a uh, campus rupestres in Portuguese, but they used to say in names rock fields. These are high specialist areas that are completely discontinuous. We used to have a large package of the rock fields in the Serra dos Pinhas that cross, that's close to the border of a uh, coastal border. Not so close, we came in about 400 kilometers, but also, you have another uh, discontinuous patch of rock fields in the middle of Cerrado. And we have also large uh, patches of palms on drainage areas. You can see this, the name of the used to say veredas. This when you have these big plateaus, you have like big uh, packages of this forest based on palms. They are so important for stingless bees because stingless bees love uh, pollen from palms. And uh, these plants were so special to attract and also to promote the establishment of these bees in these high difficult areas. I will talk about the endemism of Serrano, what, kind of, what kinds of endemism that we have in Serrano. These of uh, a bird, né? you can see it's a parrot. It's the, the name of this parrot is Papagaio Galego. It's a blonde parrot. And you can see that this animal can fly everywhere he wants, but he will not fly uh, uh, far from the Cerrado. It's completely related. It's a very good example of an uh, endemism that uh, of a big animal, like a parrot that is completely fits the Cerrado distribution. We have the, this species was described by Spix, like the, the colleague of Martius, that they, they, when they come to Brazil in eight, eight, 824. And then we have this work of uh, Augusto Antlé, another guy that walked most of Brazil, this guy, uh, collected more bees and more plants from the Cerrado Savan. And also, as you can see, he, he walked not through the middle of Cerrado, 
close to here to Goiás, but also he walked in the 800s until the Rio Grande do Sul and also close to, to Argentina. And what he collect? Probably he collect this bee, which is a melipona. And it's very interesting, but because most of our meliponas nests in, in trees. In this melipona, and uh, nest in the ground. These are high in them, it's also fit very well with the Cerrado domain, with the borders of Cerrado, what they used to say, we used this name Cerrado. And it's really interesting that we have this pressure for the bees that we have not have large trees for nesting, that the, the pressure of natural selection made this bee to go to the ground. And then you have a force that you can see clear in the plants. We have a force clear in many groups of bees and other animals that you, you must be adapted to stay without the big trees. Instead to be in the Amazon with the big trees or in, in Atlantic forest with the big trees, you need to be adapted to a place without trees. It's what happened with, with this bee, Melipona quinque fasciata, or su do chão. And also when you see the distribution, it's not so a narrow distribution only on Cerrado of Brazil. You will see Argentina, Misiones, Bolivia, Santa Cruz, Brazil in the Northeastern Ceará, close to the coast. And also you have many, many records what can be a Cerrado, a Cerrado Savona. It's clear that one bee that's adapted to, to a open area, it will not nest in the middle of the forest. It needs open areas that they it like to, to nest in the ground. It's the kind of thing that we have a really wide, Cerrado, more wider than we used to see. And also we have small endemics on Cerrado, as uh, I was discussing. We have uh, many plateaus, many high areas, and you will have also these, these small endemisms, like you have in these plateaus of Campus Rupes, the rock fields, you will find also another stingless bees that nest in the ground, that is the genus Schwarziana, all these species of Schwarziana nest in the ground. <coughs> and you will see these species completely re related with a small valley here. You can see this valley here between these two plateaus. This is a valley which is also high in the Goiás. This bee is completely isolated on this area. It's a really narrow distribution. And close to this area, you see another narrow distribution in a depression. It's about 400 meters above the sea level, very close. It's uh, here, it's where Shuaziana is. It's in the high plateau. And you, when you go to the depression, you will find the Centris teleopsis, another endemic species with a very narrow distribution in the depressions of, <coughs> of uh, Cerrado. Also, when you look to these species, like these have sister species on the forest. Schwazianas, uh, most of the species are on the Atlantic forest. When you look for Melipona, most of the species are in the Amazon or also in the Atlantic forest. And you can see like endemics that were adapted to go to open areas. You have a split from, for the, from, the, from the forest to the Cerrado, to the savanna. And also on this group, Centris teleops, I don't know if you are a are, uh, uh, friend of this group of Centris. And uh, it is like a Iptis group that has about four species. I don't remember very well the name of one of the species, but two of the species, one of them is Centris Iptis, which is from the shark areas of the Caatinga in the Northeastern. And another is Iptidoides, which was described by Hoigocina. And also Iptis and Iptidoides, almost the same, very close related. 
and say this teleopsis is a split from this both sister species from the Caatinga and Chaco. And you can say, oh, Cerrado is not just a, a process of diversification from the forest, it's also a process of diversification from the open areas from South America. When we look in the literature, we will have some studies from many authors that are pro providing information of the small and narrow endemics on Cerrado. We have many uh, proposals of areas like Araguaia River Valley, Paraná River Valley, Espinhaço Plateau, Central Goiás Plateau, many areas that we have high probability to find different species. You will see in many uh, groups, different groups, that one from, it was from the birds to the Myrtacea plants and also for, for the amphibians, you can see different uh, delimitations of narrow endemics on the Serrano. And also we have like a proposal of ecoregions for the Cerrado, that they have about 20 narrow small endemic areas on Cerrado. Then you can imagine now we only we will not have just one Cerrado, but 20 kinds of Cerrado at least. What can you think about Cerrado is not that it's just one Cerrado. When we think about Cerrado, you can think that's also related with another grassland. Llanos, savannas of Roraima, savannas, coast savannas from the Guianas and Amapá, how these areas are related, how these areas were, collect, were connected in the past. These main questions about if we have one South American savanna, or different, very distinct one, like a large package of savanna, like Cerrado, that promoted species to another small areas. That we can say, oh, we have Cerrado in smaller, Cerrado are just one big savanna. This kind of thing that is very interesting to, to think about. When we see this work of Antonelli and collaborators in 2020 is a, really nice uh, uh, question that they did about the how these ecosystems or geographic areas uh, promote diversification to another areas. You will see the Amazon, the, the name of this article is Amazon as the primary source of species to another areas of South America. And you will see the Amazon in the middle here they divide the, the South America. You can see also very interesting that you have the Cerrado in the middle, completely continuous with the savannas of the Argentina here, and also from the some Chaco that we have in Bolivia, Paraguay, and also the savanna of Cerrado connected with the Pampas. They treated, they, they, they use this name of savanna as a, just one package to delimitate the uh, influence from one ecosystem to another. And you will see the Amazon in the middle and how many contributions that they have about the sister species that are in the Amazon that have sister species in Cerrado. And they found about 517 species on Cerrado, on this group that consider Cerrado, Chaco, and Pampa that were derived from Amazon. Really nice. And then we will see how the Cerrado, this Pampa and Chaco contributed to Amazon, that they, they promoted diversification in Amazon. It's just 90. It's really nice. And you can think the, the Amazon the forest send lineage to the, 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 the Cerrado, to the savannas, and also we can find the Cerrado also send lineage to the forest. Also, we, you can see the graphic here 
that you find like Atlantic forest a receiving species from Cerrado and also sand. We will find this kind of thing in many different lineages when you have the phylogenies. Then we can see clear that Cerrado has multiple connections and mosaic of divisions and how to track the story of these, its multiple shifts, changes through the history. It's clear that the, the best thing, the most common way currently to track the, the, the age, to track the, these lineages, it's through the DNA contacts of the populations that we will be able to, to, to take away different aids that promote the pseudo congruence problem that we have the same species a uh, different species in the same place different species of the same place but these species arrived in this place in different times multiple lineages of different ages on the same area that is kind of thing that occurs in Sahab that we will have like a big area with different groups occupying this area the Tapnotaspidin, the group that I that I'm I work more time, and then it's a oil collecting bee. I don't know, but I probably most of you know what is a oil collecting bee. The oil collecting bees that bees that collect oil like resin to 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 put in the nest, also sometimes to mix with pollen to protect the nest from the water, from the fungus, from the bacteria, And also this oil has different kinds of substance and chemical defense that, that protect the nest of these bees. And the, what happened in the flowers, instead to give resin in the, in the leaves or in the trunk, they start to, to give this, this resin like oil in the flowers and these bees uh, diversified and were specialized to collect these resin, these oils in the flowers, and also you can have a, a, some adaptations, shapes of flowers and shapes of bees that can has a, a high mutualism. The, in the picture you can see here, it's a work that I published with Aline Martins about the Angelonia, which is a plantaginaceae species pollinated by a Tapnotaspidine bee. It's a small flower of Angelonia. We have Angelonia here in the market. It's a big flower. I think it's Angelonia salicarifolia, salicarifolia mutant. And here is Angelonia goiazensis, a wild species that has a perfect match with the bees. And what we can see is the distribution of Angelonia, it's a wide uh, uh, distributed species on Cerrado. And also, you will have also the distribution of the bee is quite related. Also, we have numerous species of Tapnotaspidine that, that interact with this Angelonia. This is another species of Angelonia. It's Angelonia uh, cornigera, which occurs also in Caatinga. And also we have some species in Cerrado. We have one narrow distributed species, which is Senonom da Labrata. It's not a common species, but we can find not so hard in Cerrado. It was first described by Fernando Zanella. This, this is a researcher in, in Brazil that has a very good studies about the, the bees from Cerrado, from Caatinga, from Open Ares. And also you can see, see here that we have this congruence of the plants and the bees that are pollinated by these, these bees. And you will find these triangles here, which is Paratetrapedia punctata, the bee from this picture, which fits with the distribution of the plant. But also you have a wider distribution here in the coast savannas of Amapá, then the bee can go more further than the, than the plant. Here you have another species, which is a wide endemic of Cerrado, 
is Tropidopedia punctum fons, another species that we recognize it's uh, really a problem of taxonomy problem. They are derived, derived from the problems of taxonomy from Mishne Mori in 1957. And also when we first look in the morphological phylogeny of this group that I, I did with Gabriel Mello, you can see that this group, Tropidopedia punctuus, is a forest derived uh, group from the, that we used to say that related to the East Amazon. Why, why they used to, we put this name East Amazon? Because most of the areas from the tropical areas were never worked related with the open areas. We also, the, the, the proposals from Camargo were done based on forest areas. When we start to think about more divisions related, not exactly with the forest, which was so good to work with stingless bees, but for solitary bees that are narrow or wide related with the savannas. And then you can see in blue, all these species are related with forest areas. And you will have a derived, two derived lines in the middle of, on savannas in the middle of forest land. And when you can see, there are not species of the sister species. The, the sister species of Tropidopedia punctuans is Tropidopedia flora volineata. It's a <clears throat> more, more problematic work, uh, species that fits very well the distribution of Serrano. But when you look to some records, you will see many records in the coastal savannas from northeastern Brazil. And also, we will have records of the species in Panama. Oh, we have savanna in Panama. Oh, we will have also savanna in the middle of Amazon. Is this true? Something that we must look closer to see. This is the proposal of Ruber about the savannas of Central America. And then you will see some connections of savannas in Panama and also have some pets of savannas also in the Central America. But what's the history of these savannas? Now, you saw from these examples from Tapinotas Pidine bees that you have also histories of savanna derived from forest, but also you have histories of savanna derived from open areas, <clears throat> open shark areas. This is an example of a group that I, <clears throat> I am working with Gabriel Mel about the phylogeny of uh, Tapinotospoids, which is a lineage completely related with the diagonal of open iris. And then you will see this endemic species on Cerrado that has closer species on Chaco and also in Caatinga. Then, as you can see, it's a large work based on revisions, taxonomic revisions, a large amount of taxonomy work to record the, the, the distribution of the species. It's, why, it's how we produce this, the catalog of, of neotropical bees. I, I, I did this part of Tapidontaspidine bees. And I still working with many base of data that included the re revision of types, collects in many places of neotropical region, also to work with DNA, because it's through the DNA that we will have, be able to get the aids of, from these groups. Then uh, Aline Martins, who I, had, who I work together, she, she uh, coordinated in, uh, this work that we sampled many uh, different species of the tribe Tapinotas pedini, and also we were able we were able to track the the shifts from Cerrado to another areas from the tropical region. Then we, <clears throat> you can see what we did. We she did. Uh, calibrated phylogeny 
including most of the subfamilies of epid. We use it 52 species to more than 20, more than 200 sequences. It's just a Sanger sequences. And then she did a calibrated tree based on fossils. And what we found, this tree is turned, but we can see uh, that we will have like a probability, high probability of a uh, area in a, in a proposal of a, a ancestral area for Cerrado in the first origin of the tribe here. And you will see that the Cerrado maintain as the main area that promote the diversification of species on top of aspirin. It's just when we go further in the diversification in Tapnotas Pidin, in the green circles here, you can see that the, this change for the forest. It's really clear when we see the nesting biology of these bees that you can see that most of these species that are high related with Cerrado are ground nesting. When these bees like in the paratetrapedia lineage, this bee shifts from Cerrado to the forest. This bee shifts the nesting ants to nest in wood. You can see exactly the moment that we can see this shift from the from the savanna to the to the forest areas. What we saw in the ancestral uh, reconstruction. We saw that the Cerrado-like, it's like a Cerrado appeared about 6 million years ago on South America. It seems like a, a new, really new, new uh, uh, discovery because most of the idea of the origin of Cerrado was related with the dispersion of the C4 uh, uh, grasses. And also, we found a very more older age for Cerrado. And it's not exactly like a big Cerrado. It's a, probably it's a Cerrado-like from South, South America. And it's quite related with the first fossils of grazers that we have in South America. We can see the fossils that appear the first of grazers in South America is related with this age of 6 million years. What promoted this open of, of these open areas in, in Southern South America? Problem, we will have the uplift of the Andes that promote like a shadow of rains that start to make a dry area that start to shift these areas of, from forest to open areas. You can see clear when we change just the optimization of the tree, from many uh, different areas, but just to two kinds of areas, from open areas to forest areas, that you can see that the, the main change, the main areas, ancestral areas are open, and you will have these shifts for the green in many different times, in different ages. What it means that we have these transitions from Cerrado to forest, and then to forest to Cerrado. And we can see the first transition from forest to open areas was about 6 million years. And the second transition from, from Cerrado, from a savanna to forest was about 30 million years. And the second transition from forest again to open areas was 10 to 5 million years. Most of the studies from, uh, uh, promote the idea that Cerrado appeared about 10 million, 10 million years. This is the last transition from forest to open areas. It was not the first transition. We can see this, this transition is exactly that transition that we have more contribution of Amazon to Cerrado. It's about 10 to 5 million years. And the main process of diversification of the bees of the Tapinotaspidine bees is related with the Mopigasa plants. And it's 
very similar to what occurred in Centridine bees. We in Centridine is a large group, more complex, but in Tapnotspidine, it seems more clear that we will have here Moneca. It's a group of bees that has exactly the same behavior on flowers, the same shape of oil collecting apparatus of centuries on flowers, and then fits very well and only on Mopigasia. Then we will have change for many different families of oil collecting plants in different aids related with the diversification of different groups like Calipogenus, Tapnotaspoides, Arhizosibli, Lantanomelissa, which are more related with other kinds of plants like Iridacea, uh, Plantaginacea. This is the transition that were more recently than the, this older relation in Mopigasia. Then we have like a, <clears throat> this kind of uh, concept that we discussed, the José Maria Cardoso da Silva in 1997 used to work with this idea of that we have the paleolineage and neolineage endemics on Cerrado. We can use this term here also that we have the paleolineage. Paleolineage was this first transition from the, from the open areas to the savannas in the that we have also these genus that are most of them are paleolineage, that they are delivered from the first transitions. And then we have neolineage, that lineage that were transitioned from the forest to the cerrado. When, this, when appear this species very, very young, it's in the top of the tree. You have here many different species that shift from the forest to the, to the savanna very recently. Also very interesting, we did a work, I, I need to put the name of uh, Thais Ribeiris, it's also in this talk here. Uh, I need to put her, her image, I'm, I'm sorry Thais, I forgot to put your, your picture. Thais and also Aline Martins worked in this group and also I, I helped to collect the bees, to choose the sample. And what we saw, it's very interesting that probably the dispersion from the savanna, very recently the dispersion from the C4 grasses did not occur first to Serrad, but occurred lately to Pampas. And what we can see like a dispersion of the savannas first from this shack, what could be the uh, ancestral area of savannas here in the southern. And first, the dispersion was to, to Pampas. And we, at 15 million years ago, what probably promoted the diversification of Lantana Melissa in all the lineage that includes Arrizos, Lantanella. And we have a second dispersion to the Cerrado 10 million years ago of the sequato uh, grasses. It's very interesting that we can see that the, why Cerrado is so different because it has these shifts also, these younger shifts from the Amazon and Atlantic forest to the savannas. And then the white pampa is not so diversified because it not have these shifts, contributions from the Amazon and contributions, very few contributions from Atlantic Forest. When we go up in the phylogeny, that's the this kind of work that I am doing recently. Is the it's also a work that I was promising to send to Zotaxa and I did not send. I will send to another web because I am late. Uh, it's also the phylogeny and also taxonomic revision of some uh, more recently groups like Chantopedia, that we will have many endemics in the borders of savanna and in the middle of the savanna, close to the forest. This is very interesting because it was a really recently diversification process that we can see the, the, this contribution very recently from Cerrado 
to the forest from Cerrado to another kinds of savanna that we can see in the coast of South America, in the coast of Guyana, and also in another places of the Antarctic region. Well, the, then, uh, what is my perspective of study? To still collecting and also to make a large data bank of the bees from Cerrado, to try to, to monitor the also to understand the shifts of the species between Cerrado and then the more uh, uh, distant areas of savanna, like savanna from Amapá, from savannas from Rondônia, savannas from the borders of other big areas of forest in South America. I want to, to collect in all these 20 areas that they promote as ecoregions of so, Cerrado to understand how is the age of this, these areas and also the gaps that we have in these areas of that we don't know exactly the bees that they are. And also we want to make the DNA barcode of these species to understand the, the age of these, these bees to make more taxonomic revisions. We currently, I'm working the Chantopedia revision with a student that finished his master and also a large work of his Ossibi. And also I have a work with UCs, with Philippe Freitas, which we are revising all the classification of Tapinota beginning that we have some shifts, mainly in Calipogenes, that we will see that we, that we will have a, Another large groups of genera that we need to revise the, how we will treat these groups. I'm very thankful to the group of the lab. We, I cannot do nothing if I don't have the help of the students. They are always there collecting, promoting questions, mounting material, making the lab much more happier. I also very thankful for my university, University of Brasilia, and also for the scientific agents from my state, which is FAPDEF, who gave me money to make my colleagues, to make all the, the research projects. Any questions, you can also send to my email. Thanks, Victoria. Great, much... thanks, Antonio. I'll let Lawrence take over here, but please everyone add your questions to the Q&A box uh, through Zoom. You see at the very bottom of your screen, there's two little conversation bubbles. Um, add your questions there and then Lawrence will be able to pose it to Antonio. <clears throat> okay, so thank you, Antonio. A um, lot of interesting things in there. Um, I know, I'll start off. There's no questions that have arrived in the Q&A yet. Um, Several of your phylogeny showed um, Calopaginus as being polyphyletic. Yes. What was the question? Uh, so, I, well, I, I, are you going to divide Calopaginus up into more than one genus? Because it yes. came out as polyphyletic in several yes. of the trees. Yes, we, we can see that the, pro, that the first proposal from Mishnah and, and Mori, 90, 97. Do you remember this work of Antofor no parasitic is and uh, that blue cover that he has this study that promotes the tapinohina, <clears throat> calepogenus, lantanella. They are correct, they are completely correct. Uh, Mission and Mori did a really good work, and then we, we we need to go back to see again Mishne Mori because uh, the UCs and also some analysis on uh, sequences, it's clear that we have a high support of at least three groups that was treated by Hugo Sino 997 as just one genus. We, we have Lantanella, we had, which we are already published in, uh, it's, we have no doubts about Lantanella, it's a group related with Lantanomelisa lineage. And also we have the Tapinohina, which splits very far from Calipogenes, which is Calipogenes has a species 
type species Calepogenus millen. And Tapnohina is Calepogenus, I, I will not remember the name. Is that Calepogenus from Chile, the most common? Oh, um, Cerulea. Yes, yeah, that's it, Cerulea. Well, I look, I, yeah, I look forward to seeing, I'm not sure I've seen the Lanthanella paper, so I'll have to do a bit of a digging to find that. Um, Paolo Souza, oi Antonio, how are you? Thank you for your talk. It's always a pleasure to hear you talk with such passion about the Sahado and its bees. My question is, the data showed that more xeric areas may have higher bee species richness. In your opinion, could the Sahado and other South American savannas be the centers of speciation for South American bees? I don't know. It's really hard because I think that it will depend from group to group. We cannot talk like to, to talk these two stingless bees. We can we can talk about these two, maybe two centridines, are you collecting bees like centridine? to tapinotaspidine, to tetrapedine, but for stingless bees and, and orchid bees, you cannot say that. When you say about oh, all the bees, no, 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 all the bees, no. All the bees have different easters. Some of them related to forest, some to open areas. When you say about inforine bees, they do not like forest, these bees. They are completely related with open areas. Then you, you can divide very clear the bees from forest and from the, the open area. And Tapinotas Pini is really a nice group that you can have this clear shift that you can see in the nesting behavior from the ground to the forest. All right, thank you. Uh, Paul Geisendorfer, thanks for the interesting talk. How do Sahado bees react to logging corridors? into the Amazon or the Atlantic forest. Uh, do these logging corridors positively affect their distribution? <clears throat> yeah, it really affect it. So they really, we, we know many works about the, these corridors that connect the Atlantic forest and also the Amazon. We have like my hands here, you maybe you can see clear that Serrado is like a plateau that in the middle of my hands, and the rivers are my fingers. These on the north Amazon, these in the south are the, the rivers from the Paraná River and these rivers that goes to the south. And then some places, almost these forests contact each other. And you can have a, a large a, a corridors for many species that we cannot see division from the one species from one side to another of Cerrado, from one forest to another. It's really common to, to see that, but we, it's interesting, but when you look to the limits of these species from the Amazon that rains through the Atlantic forest, they stop in the uh, Capricornio uh, parallel. They cannot go deeper in the Atlantic forest. They stop. And also, it usually do not go to the northeastern uh, 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 Atlantic forest. They just go inside the Atlantic, but not in the coastal of the Atlantic forest. It's very okay, Thank you. I think the question was more about when people go in and they chop down trees in the forest, does that makes the habitat drier? And are the Taspino Taspidini uh, that are adapted to drier Sahado areas, are they going into the forests as the forests are cleared? No, you, we, we have uh, species that are related to savanna clearly related to savanna and some species that are, that are clearly related to the forest. These species do not uh, use the same habitat. They, they, it's like you say, Paratazapelia punctata, a species that is from savanna, it not goes to the forest, never. You cannot see them. It's like a, this bee is not able to fly higher. When you see Paratazapelia connexa, or Paratetrapedia, uh, uh, let's see, Fervida. 
which is a species from Atlantic forest. This species never go far to the middle of savanna. When you collect this bee, just try to look, you will see a patch of forest somewhere. Because this bee depend of some kind of wood that has some kind of nesting after that this bee never go far from the forest. They are so specialist, it's really difficult to, I think just one or two species that are able to like adapt like in urban place. I can saw some few species adapting to urban places, but so hard to have species very adapted to changing in the environment. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I got another question. So your phylogeny showed that ancestrally the Tapino Taspidini were in dry areas. Yeah. And so collecting oil is is that that having oil in the nest to defend against bacteria and fungi would make more sense if they originated in the forests because it's more humid and more and more promoting of fungal growth. So the so the reason for them collecting oil seems to me less likely due to you know bacteria and fungal defense if they originated in dry areas. Yeah, maybe. And when you think about there were dry areas like Chaco and also Serrano and also Caatinga, you can think like a dry area. But when you go in May or in April or in December to Serrano, some months, specific months, you have a high amount of water, high amount of water. The, the, the rain season is, is very short and very dense. And in this is time that we will have the flowers. The bees do not fly in the dry season, just fly in the rainy season. These bees need to, to nest when we they have the flowers, the, the food. And then we okay. cannot forget that. The, okay. the, the, the rain happens when we, ha we have the flowers. All right, so it's, a, so it's a matter of the amount of rainfall as the bees are foraging that is the yes. determinant of, of the oil. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, so yeah, I guess it, it'd be interesting for you know people not from Brazil to know how exactly how seasonal the that rainfall is. Like how much rain do you get in the year, and how much rain do you get in specific months? You know, I'm I'm used to working in the Atacama, where if it rains at all, it's remarkable. Um, but in many parts of the world, uh, you know, it, like here in Canada, it, you know, you, you get rain most most months of the year, right? rain or snow. So, are there any more questions for Antonio? All righty. Well, it just leaves me to thank you for a talk from a part of the world we don't hear enough about. Yeah, I, I can imagine this kind of thing. It's really difficult. Some these days I, I heard a boy talking about Tibet. I never been in Tibet. How it's Tibet if you have forests or savannas? I don't know nothing. And then I think I must show something about Cerrado for the people. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you also. Very thanks for everybody. And thanks for the questions. And I'm available through my mail. I'm completely available. Thanks, Victoria. Yeah. I look forward to reading some of the papers of yours that I haven't come across that you mentioned. Yes, I, I, I need to, to, to go ahead. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. So thanks, Antonio. Just a reminder to everybody that this recording will be posted in the next day or so, uh, but to check out our YouTube channel for it and other talks. As well, next month, we have one more um, edition of our Bee Best series before the summer, uh, looking at more cuckoo bees. So please pre-register for that. You can pre-register for it now, get the Zoom link, and also get reminders. Um, so I encourage you to just head over to yorku.ca slash bee slash packer to pre-register. And that's it. We'll see you all next month. Great.
Thanks very much. So I'll be in touch, Antonio.